It's a privilege and honor for me to be here this afternoon to help celebrate the life of Daniel Ward Kelleher. Dude to his grandkids, my dad had a paper route at age 12. Dude and I both shared a love for music. I could always count on Dude for a physics lesson, a laugh, a hug. I'll miss him dearly, but man, am I glad that I knew him. So here we are to honor Daniel and his life together in this virtual and very real place of gathering. Our family that aren't here, like they also thought she was their grandma. She was everyone's grandma. And um, I only hope that I can live up to her. Thank you all for being here. I love you so much. I didn't expect anybody other than Debbie and me to be here. We thought we were gonna be all alone and we got everybody. Oh, it means so much to us. Suzanne and I am the Gathering Us facilitator for today's event. We are going to get started today by watching a slideshow. During these days of struggle, we really need to have words of hope. While I and my family stand deeply grieved, we are also thankful for the chance to have had her. I'm so happy everybody could do this. We were feeling very lonely. Thank God for technology. Yeah, that's for sure. Thank you all from the bottom of my heart for like coming here and doing this with us. It took a little convincing to mom and dad that this would work, but <laughs> I'm glad they did. Thank you everybody for joining us here today. We are on day three of Green Funerals Week and it looks like we're slowly filling up the seats in the room. We're hovering at about 50. It's a pretty good turnout. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started. And uh, we thought we'd kick it off with, by saying thank you to our sponsor, Gathering Us, and show you a little informational video about the services they're offering. And People's Memorial members do get a discount on their services. So if you're interested in that, we can go ahead and get you some information over about that. Okay. People's Memorial Association would like to acknowledge the traditional, ancestral, unceded territory of the Coast Salish, Duwamish, and Suquamish nations on which we work and live. So I'm right here in the People's Memorial office today, and most of our staff here is local to the Seattle area. Just to get started, a couple of housekeeping items. We're going to go ahead and have all of our participants keep themselves on mute just to reduce some of the background noise. We will be recording today's presentation, so don't worry if you can't get your notes jotted down as quickly as you'd like. We'll make sure you have uh, access to all the information shared today. If any questions come up, feel free to go ahead and drop those into the chat box. If you have something you'd like to remain anonymous, feel free to directly message either myself or Amanda Stock, and we'll be happy to share your question as well. We're going to go ahead and have our presenter answer as many questions as possible at the end of his presentation. And don't worry if you can't quite figure out how to word it just yet. We'll make sure you have contact information for ourselves and for our presenters so you can contact uh, either of us later on with whatever questions come up. And in case you're new to People's Memorial and you're just joining us for the first time today, a little bit about us. We happen to be the oldest and largest memorial society in the United States. We were founded in 1939 and just this past year we had a big to-do to celebrate our 80th anniversary. So we've been in here in Seattle for a minute. We are the only nonprofit in Washington that provides funeral education and advocacy, though we are an affiliate of the National Funeral Consumers Alliance. So there's about 72 other organizations around the country doing similar work to us. So even if you aren't here in Washington, it's distinctly possible there's another organization a little closer to your home that does some similar work. Ourselves, we I think just broke the cap on 215,000 members. 
about 70,000 of those folks are still living. So we have a pretty robust membership here. And in terms of the work we do on a day-to-day -day basis, one of our big priorities, of course, is education. We love to offer free classes and resources just like this. Uh, we wanna make sure that folks have the most information possible to make informed decisions and have good open communication with their families and friends about the needs that they have about end of life. We also are kept pretty busy with some of the advocacy work that we do. Uh, we do state level legislative lobbying to increase funeral choices, ensure price transparency in the funeral industry, and we work really hard to protect folks' rights to their uh, cultural practices and make sure their spiritual and emotional needs are able to be met at end of life, which is a pretty important time. And the thing that kind of is the background to all of this is it's really important to us that everybody has access to affordable and dignified options at end of life. And so maybe membership kind of speaks to you. And if you're thinking that that is something you'd like to pursue, there's a lifetime membership fee of $50. It's just that one time fee per person. And we are contracted with about 23 or 25 funeral homes around Washington. And uh, we do a lot of work every couple of years to screen those funeral homes to make sure that they are good ethical businesses. They're operating transparently. You're not going to get that used car sales experience at a time where you're already kind of going through a lot. So one of the major discounts, or I'm sorry, one of the major benefits that drives folks to People's Memorial is that we do offer discounted rates through those contracted providers for the costs of burial and cremation. So that can be a really big uh, savings opportunity for your family. We also have a couple of contracted cemeteries we work with, a monument company and a couple of other folks. And uh, another option is we know that folks in Seattle are pretty big in the co-op movement. Um, we do have a member owned co-op funeral home here in Seattle. So we still have a couple more sessions left in our Green Funerals Week. Today is day three, but we hope to see you later this week. We've got a presentation coming up tomorrow about natural organic reduction, uh, also called recom Recompose. Later this week, Amanda and I will be doing a presentation about uh, factor fiction to take a look at some of those green burial products we all see floating around the internet. And then on Saturday, we hope you'll join us for some facilitated discussion about some of the topics that we've covered this week. So every day at noon, we'll be, we'd love to see you join us for those other subjects. We're really excited to host Dion today. He's the founder from First Call Mortuary Services. And today he's gonna to be presenting about aquamation, which is also called alkaline hydrolysis. And I'm gonna go ahead and share a video that he has for you all. Um, a news story that he thinks is gonna give you some really good perspective or just a little bit of background actually on what he's gonna be talking about today. So let me cue that up for you. Can I get a thumbs up from you, Amanda, if you can see the video? I can see the appropriate window. Mm -hmm. People in Portland now have environmentally friendly options, even after they've passed away. It's a relatively new form of human cremation that works through a process using water instead of fire. Take a look. This is more of a, a jacuzzi tub effect on the body. Here at First Call Mortuary Services in Northeast, you'd never know this high-tech machine uses a century-old process. It was used years ago and is still used in animal research. Um, and then it took a human application with Mayo Clinic about 2006. It's called alkaline hydrolysis, commonly known as aqua cremation. First Call has the first highly pressurized version of the process west of the Mississippi. And owner Dion Strummer tells us using water instead of fire drastically reduces carbon emissions. And why I brought it to the Portland area is because it's 90% less carbon footprint and one tenth the energy is used compared to a flame crematory. It all works through a combination of water flow, temperature, and alkalinity that accelerates the body's natural decomposition in just about four hours. And you can see the big difference over traditional methods. So they're whiter in color 
compared to a flame cremation that's just gray. There's actually 20% more cremated remains. Now, Strummer is hoping to spread the word about how people can still help the world continue to grow long after they're gone. Well, I think for Oregonians, we think differently that way in that we're, we're concerned about the planet, the environment, and so, so our mind is moving more towards this in all aspects of our life. First Call has cremated eight bodies this way so far this year. Strummer says families can work through their own funeral homes to contract them for services. Now, the process is more expensive than traditional cremation, about five to $800 more on average. Okay, I think we can skip Meet the Press. All right, wonderful. What a cool little segment, Dion. Can I go ahead and hand it over to you and you can start your presentation up? Yes, uh, I just uh, bring my screen. <clears throat> oh, good. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, it's good to have all of you. It, it's amazing what this year has brought about in all kinds of industries, especially in the death care industry. Uh, I appreciated the opening uh, video of, uh, of how people are adapting uh, in this time of COVID. Of course, like your year has been different, mine's been very different. I'm, I'm part of a, a federal disaster team and actually January 31st, I was called up to go assist with the repatriating US citizens from Wuhan, China. If you remember way back this early uh, uh, winter, uh, uh, early spring, and then, and then we did the quarantining for the Oakland cruise ship, the Japanese cruise ship. And then we realized that COVID had spread. And so by uh, mid, March, uh, we just opened the borders and, and it was here to stay. So we had tried to contain it. I had gotten home about a day from uh, the last quarantine I was assisting with and was sent to New York City where uh, we took care of uh, 35,000 COVID deaths. So it's been an unusual year. I returned home in, in June and then I just returned home from a two week deployment down with the Oregon wildfires uh, where we thought we might have hundreds of deaths Luckily, we did not. We, we had nine for the state. So, so I'm involved in lots of different things, but it has been an unusual year. Really excited today to be able to be with you and talk about flameless cremation, green cremation, bio cremation, uh, aqua cremation. I've, I've come up with that name, or I shouldn't say I, it's gotten that moniker because uh, uh, we ask people in different seminars, uh, you know, what, ex what to them explains this process better. And, and people like the idea of aquamation, aqua cremation um, over alkaline hydrolysis, which is the scientific name. Why, why of course, aqua cremation? It uses one-tenth the energy. So we leave a 90% less carbon footprint. It is so good for our, our environment. And we'll get in a little bit more details with that. Also with the death care industry, uh, flame cremation is coming under scrutiny. Here in Oregon, our Governor Brown a year ago has asked that all incineraries, uh, crematories being one of them, be looked at again for their emissions and the concerns they have with that. Even though we're a small part of those emissions, uh, we're coming to find out in the death care industry what we thought was eco-friendly flame cremation, we're realizing is not as clean as we would like. And so um, alkaline hydrolysis. I had first heard about this back in about 2009, um, but it's been around for a hundred years. It's always been used in animal research. And what I mean by that is when they gave an animal a bacteria, a virus, uh, uh, Ebola, they used alkaline, hydrolys uh, alkaline hydrolysis to eradicate even the prions of Cruxville Jacob, which are mad cow and human. And actually those that are old enough uh, can remember uh, in the eighties when the mad cow uh, had, uh, had uh, overtaken in Europe. And that's one of the ways they eradicated the folded protein they call a prion in Cruxville Jacob. And so it, it completely destroys those bacteria, viruses, uh, Ebola, Cruxville Jacob, coronavirus, it, it all is destroyed in this kind of system. That's why they were using it in animal research. Took a human application in 1998 when the University of Florida for their whole body donation program uh, started using alkaline hydrolysis. My alma mater, the University of Minnesota in 2005, put one in for their whole body uh, 
cadaver program. And then Mayo Clinic, and this is about the time I started hearing about it when Mayo Clinic put one in for their, their facility uh, to be more eco-friendly and they, they gave their name, uh, it, gave, it gave alkaline hydrolysis some credence. And so uh, I'm coming to find out as I visit with people, and I understand this week you've already talked about cremation. I'm finding as I visit with different groups uh, before the COVID, that's part of what I did is I went around and educating people about alkaline hydrolysis along with training funeral directors. But I'm, at, at those uh, meetings, I come to find out a lot of people uh, didn't understand cremation in the sense of, of the process, meaning that it's a direct flame on the body. A lot of people, and I think it comes from, we used to call it the, the Nazi ovens from, from the Holocaust, that people were baked down to ashes. And about, uh, I've come to find out about half the people believed that. And, and that was surprising to me because I thought everyone knew that it was flame cremation. Uh, I often ask what people think the cremation rate is in the Northwest. It's actually running about 80% here in Portland now. Uh, this, this slide's a couple years old, is actually 92% here in the Portland area. Um, so uh, I believe in time because of regulations with the DEQ, the EPA, uh, our local governments, We'll, we'll put pressure on flame cremation to raise the cost where it's not as affordable. Again, this is my personal opinion. Um, one of the concerns again is the pollution, but the biggest concern with flame cremation is the mercury in our fillings, which is kind of surprising. The tribes for years in Oregon have petitioned the state government about the mercury that, that's coming from crematories, the rain takes to the streams, the, the fish take it up, and it's in their diet. Uh, now, Dion, now that's I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I don't think we're able to see your slides. Did you have those up on your side? Yes, I do. Do you see Ooh. any of that? Will you go ahead and share your screen with us? It looks like we didn't get that connected up just right. Okay, so you're not seeing a thing here. Let me come back. Whoop. Uh, okay. Yeah, we don't want to miss any of that good information you're sharing. What, what do you see now? Um, uh, nothing. So you'll need to go ahead and click share screen. Okay. On the bottom. All right. I'm going to have to, uh, j sorry, I'm going to pop through all these to get to the end. I can't seem to exit. <laughs> so I apologize. Do you know about when you lost the screen? Oh, we haven't been able to see your slides just yet. You haven't so seen any. No, I, we were just captivated by what you were talking about. Oh, we didn't wow. know there were any I apologize. images. I am really sorry. I thought you had that. Oh, okay. Everything looked, wow. I had some really cool slides, folks. Sorry. Oh, uh, man. <laughs> well, we better uh, take me, a quick look. Let me quickly, let me quickly then. Um, wow. Okay. Now we can see your screen. Now, now you're seeing a type mm -hmm. of screen, just, uh, yeah. okay. Let me, let me enlarge this here. I apologize for the, now are you seeing aqua cremation flameless? Yep, looks perfect. Okay. Thank you, Dion. All right, I apologize everyone. So I'm gonna pop that through, happens. why cremation? <laughs> and so I had some really cool slides. Um, so we were talking about the bugs and bacteria and how it destroys that, the human application, Mayo Clinic, cremation rate, uh, EPA, the pressures, mercury, that's kind of where I left off. And what I'm showing now, do you see that machine there, the drawing? It's called a scrubber. And in Europe, they've had to do this and where they've gone regional crematories uh, because they required scrubbers on their crematories. So a crematory is about $250,000 to purchase uh, in US dollars. And then a scrubber would add about $750,000 more dollars to the project. And so you're looking at almost a million dollar investment to do cremation. And I see that's why I think private small business would probably, areas would go more into um, uh, what I want to say, regional crematories if it was to continue. So I believe in time, aqua cremation will outpace flame cremation in another generation. I'm talking 20 years. So I'm saying water instead of fire. Again, repeating some of the same things, one tenth the energy uh, is used 90% less carbon footprint, actually because it's gentler on the body than the flame cremation, which is kind of harsh, we actually end up with 20 to 30% more cremated remains. And I was talking earlier about flame cremation. Uh, I, I talk about that in my presentations to let families know 
they call it ashes. We call it cremated remains in the death care industry, but it's actually the, the calcium phosphate that's left. It's the bones after cremation. All the tissue is, is uh, of course, burned, even the marrow inside the bones, and we're left with calcium phosphate, the bones uh, that are left. And so that's run through a processor and a family gets back cremated remains, or they call ashes, which are really ground bones. So same with aquamation. People ask with aquamation, what do I get back? You get the calcium uh, phosphate back. You get the bones back. Only they're lighter in color because there's no carbon from the flame. And you actually receive 20 to 30% more. So this is me along with my two sons. And we brought this to Portland in, in the early spring of 2018. You'll see the machine and also that tank to the right. And I'm gonna talk about that tank in a few minutes. I had to try it on for size. Uh, the machine will hold a 500 pound person. It's not uncommon that we do 500 pound people this day and age, uh, we're all getting bigger. Um, so I, I wouldn't let them close the door. I just had to try it on for size. But I wanted you to, to see the inside of the machine down at the end on the right here, you see the two heaters that help heat the water because we use uh, heated water along with potassium hydroxide, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. There's a propeller at the end that helps move the body that, or excuse me, moves the, the water that, that the body is placed in this cage that you see me in. And that's again, what, what contains the calcium phosphate, the bones that are left. And we'll talk about that. This is our machine in Portland. We dedicated to Iris Green. She was a science teacher from Eugene, Oregon. She was terminal with cancer, heard about this product, heard that we were bringing it to Portland, the first one this side of the Mississippi on the West Coast. And uh, uh, we dedicated the machine to her. She died in April. We got it up and running in early March or May, excuse me. And, uh, and so uh, we call it the green machine, that, that kind of human interest story we can't even make up. Uh, she was a science teacher in life and in death. Her daughters told me that after they went through her files, they found uh, oh, little bones of mice and, and owls and other creatures that she, she kept as part of her science class. So let's talk about hydrolysis. And then we'll talk about uh, the alkalinity the, uh, of alkaline hydrolysis. Hydrolysis is just the breaking down of our tissue to its basic form. And that would happen. To me, aqua cremation actually mimics earth burial closer than it does cremation. We call it cremation because we have these remains left, these bones. And so it's gotten that, that name, but it actually, the process mimics green burial closer than it does cremation, I think personally. I say that because the process in four hours reduces the body to amino acids, to peptides, to salt, sugars, and soaps. The exact thing that would occur if you put a body right next to the soil, that may take years to happen, but this does it in, in a four hour cycle. So, so this is a, just an x-ray of a body in the machine. Uh, and we'll get, get back to that. So, so it's really kind of comparing a, a diesel truck to a Prius. It's really that simple and families get that and people understand this is eco-friendly. So this is what occurs after the process. All the soft tissue is gone. We have what's left, the calcium phosphate, you've heard me say, the bones that are left. They're actually bone shadows. They're very fragile and, and they're easy to process through. And these are some cremated remains here. They're white in color because there's no carbon from the flame. And uh, someone asked me once at a, at a green burial conference, how can this be eco-friendly? You're just spitting or spewing out what the manufacturers have told you about, that it uses one-tenth the energy 90% less carbon footprint. And I had to agree, you're right. I didn't do a study. So I went to the internet hunting and I found this master's thesis done by Elizabeth Kaiser out of the Netherlands where she took the environmental impacts of funeral. Here she's comparing it into euros, but she even took the growing of the flowers, the growing of the wood for a wood casket, people driving to the funeral, uh, all those things taken into account. And she found that alkaline hydrolysis actually has, as you see at the bottom of the graph, uh, negative as in a good way, being a positive, that we have no particular matter formation and no human toxicity to the environment. And, and she also showed how the CO2 levels 
even even she used cryomation, which is done in theory. No one's really uh, produced the machine because it's very expensive. The cryomation is where you would freeze dry a body with nitrogen and then vibrate it on a table to where it, it falls into a million pieces. And then you bury that. Um, it even has aqua cremation, even has less CO2 than cryomation. Uh, so, so it's kind of interesting that her study that she had done. And so that's that's now I can feel confident when I say it's one tenth the energy, leaves less environmental impact, and, and it's been proven. Uh, the news article said we've done eight. That was two years ago. We're up into over a thousand uh, decedents that we've run through our machine. I've run a cousin myself. I've used it personally that way. Uh, my good uh, maintenance man, Carl, who helped me put the machine in, he died of cancer last year. He asked to be put in Iris, the green machine, and uh, he, he wanted to make sure that was done. So um, I've seen the process done. And to me, it's just so convenient and clean. Um, I wanted to talk about alkaline, the alkalinity alkaline, uh, the, uh, of alkaline hydrolysis. We use potassium hydroxide. And someone asked me once at a green barrier, how, how can this be greener if you use a chemical? That's a great question. I buy it from a chemical company. It is a naturally found chemical. It's also an FDA food grade ingredient. It's, it's used in our beauty products. I've kind of gotten ahead of myself, but it's how people make soap today. <laughs> they used what they called potash caustic lye. And how you made potash is you took your ashes from your fire, you put it in a pot. So this is how the pioneers did it. And that's where it got its name, potash. They would add water, boil that down and would skim off what's called caustic lye, potassium hydroxide. They would take then the, 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 the renderings from an animal, the fat and, and make soap. It's actually how we make soap today. It, it is uh, it is in our beauty products. Potassium hydroxide is, is used in beer and it's used in our beauty products. It's what gives soap the power to take the dirt off your hands. It's very small amounts, the amounts we, we use it, it's very caustic. And so we use it amount of 10% of body weight. So a 200 pound person, we, we would use 20 pounds of potassium hydroxide. I wanted to talk about the, uh, the affluent, the wastewater that is, that, that is left from the machine. And so uh, we start with 80 gallons of water. There's a couple of rinse cycles that happen. So we use 220 gallons of water, which I know sounds like a lot. It's about what a family of four uses in a day with their laundry and showering and, and, and uh, dishes and all the other things we use in a home. Um, but I think it's important to understand, and I've learned a lot about waste management. Waste management does everything they can to recycle every drop of water. I mentioned that tank that we have. I don't have to go to a tank. I can go directly to waste management with my affluent, which is the fancy name for wastewater. Um, I capture in a tank so that I have a couple of farmers, not as many as I'd like, partly because I haven't had the time to get out and promote it. But uh, we have found through, through the years of using animal affluent that it makes a great plant nutrient. And it just a couple of years ago got approved in Indiana, the affluent, animal affluent, as an organic fertilizer. It makes a great plant nutrient. It's because of the amino acids uh, that are in the affluent. A couple of things to know about the affluent. It, it is completely sterile. It's 60,000 times more sterile than the equipment that comes out of an autoclave that I use in my embalming room. There is no DNA. There is no RNA. If I've seen anything negative on the internet about aqua cremation or alkaline hydrolysis, it is they're flushing grandma down the toilet. I think it's important to understand you could take a sample of it and you'd have no grandma DNA. It is completely sterile. That's why they use it in research. It kills those prions. It can reduce uh, all those viruses to nothingness. And so it's uh, interesting uh, and so, so I have a grass seed farmer. I have a tree farmer that picks up my affluent from that tank. And uh, when I have another decedent to run, another cycle to run, and, and the tanks are not empty or they haven't come by, then it will go to the waste management. So when people ask me what happens with the waste, or excuse me, the, the wastewater, the affluent, 
I tell them it's recycled and it's recycled in two ways. One, one we use it as a plant nutrient. The other is if it goes into waste management, waste management likes it because those amino acids feed the good bacteria that help clean up the system. It also helps to clean their pipes. And so in Portland, waste management is very forward thinking on this. They were happy to hear that we brought it in. But the way it's recycled is waste management does everything they can to get every drop of water back out of that affluent. So it's recycled in two different ways. So it gives more of a circle of life. And that's what I want to understand. We have the ability to, to a family probably doesn't want to deal with 80 gallons of affluent, but how about five gallons or 10 gallons? And we're able to, to do that to where we take, um, excuse me, take five gallons of the affluent, the family can bury the ashes, plant a tree, and then use the affluent to, to uh, help uh, 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 fertilize that tree. Um, so, so again, my son with, with his, uh, his uh, fun putting my uh, PowerPoint together gave me lots of circle of life uh, pictures. So if you have more questions, uh, you have my website you can go to. I, I believe we have the news video. I, I believe we have this presentation. You can go there for clients that use us. Uh, again, People's Memorial uses us. There's several firms out of Washington that do, but uh, um, I guess I'm, I'm at the point, I'm open to questions. I'm not sure how we, how we uh, go back to that. Again, I apologize, you didn't see my earlier videos. Thank you so much, Dion, that was wonderful. Yeah. We've got a bunch of great questions for you. Okay, great. You ready? I think I am. Okay, wonderful. Well, let's start with how hot does the water get during the Good. acclimation process? Good question. There are uh, two systems. One is called low temp or high temp, or you can think of it as low pressure and high pressure. Um, there's a firm here in Oregon, down in Roseburg, Oregon, that put in a low pressure, low temperature system, meaning the water gets to 165 degrees, which is what is, comes out of your shower, basically. Mm -hmm. So ours being a high pressure system, and the reason I put in a high pressure system is because I have to be able in the metro area to be able to turn that around and do more than just one in a day. So a low pressure system takes about uh, 12 to 14 hours. Mine takes four hours cycle. And, and so it allows us to get the water 140 degrees hotter. So we get to 302 degrees to answer your question. Now we all know water boils at 212. Someone said, well, you're boiling the body. We are not. And I'll tell you why, because we, that, that vessel has a steam jacketed vessel, which allows us to put pressure that keeps us from boiling that water, allows us to get the temperature to 302 degrees, which helps us cut down the time. Uh, and and uh, that's why, why we add, we add the, uh, the water temperature to 302. Um, I hope that answers the question. Okay. Well, that's great. Yeah, I saw someone kind of cheekily say something on social media yeah, about yeah. aquamation is your last spa day. Like, it's yeah, just like yeah. and it is a jacuzzi tub effect. I said that in the news article, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. Um, would you speak to what happens to chemicals if the body's embalmed before being aquamated? Great, good question. Completely neutralized. And we do embalm bodies. We do autopsy bodies. We do those type of things here is completely neutral neutralizes. Now I'm not a biologist, but I talked to a biologist friend that tells me that even, even the radioactive isotopes that are used to treat cancer are reduced enough to be safe to go into the waste management system. It's pretty incredible. I did not realize that until about January of this year and talking with our local uh, 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 city of Portland water management, the biologist there. Uh, that it actually can reduce those radioisotopes to make them safe for the waste management system. So it completely neutralizes them. But a good point with your question on chemicals is uh, also the system does not eat cotton. It does not eat polyesters. It does not do clothing. It will do 100% wool, 100% leather. Uh, and so we actually drape the body uh, for modesty always. We keep it in a hospital gown. But we do have a... a a uh, woolen, or excuse me, a silk wrap. That's a rough silk. It's not the silk you think of very fine silk. It's a raw silk that we can wrap the body if someone is concerned. But most people are fine with us having it in a hospital gown uh, and then pulling that hospital gown, gown off just before we close the door. A family can be in attendance. They can press the button. You can have a, what we call a placement viewing. 
You can have services at a church. You can have everything the same with the body present. Uh, and then it would be brought back here. We would undress it, place it in a hospital gown and run it through the system. So everything can be the same as you would think of a flame cremation or a burial. Just, uh, just at the end, we go out the way we came in this life. That's really apt. Uh, so we did have someone who was asking about um, organic medical waste. Can these machines process that? You mentioned sometimes you receive bodies back that have been autopsied. Um, could you speak to that? Yeah, it, it, it does. And there are companies, and actually that's how this, after the animal uh, waste uh, or animal carcasses were used to neutralize uh, disease and things, it's been taken to that aspect to be used in, in other, other waste management. Yeah. What about inorganic medical waste? We have some folks who are curious about what happens to hardware that might be in the decedent's Oh, body. great, great question. Yes, the, uh, the hardware is recycled. It, mm -hmm. it looks just like the day it went in. It's completely shiny and new, unlike with a flame crematory because of the carbon, mm -hmm. that titanium and others. But we will get, get even the, uh, the, you know, the stainless steel wires if someone was, uh, you know, had been wired, at, at, uh, let, let's say, cardiac surgery years ago, uh, and now that's changed so much. But yes, all that metal is, is run through a recycle stream. Um, also, we have families that want the gold of the teeth. That's, that's a, a way we can return the whole crown back to you. <laughs> the tooth is a, is a bone shadow. It will just, it will completely crumble. And I can give you back the, uh, the crowns, if you wish. And we have a lot of families, even with flame cremation, would like the gold back. But gold melts at such a, a low heat that mm -hmm. all we get are little BBs and it's hard to tell if it's gold or not. Wow, that's kind of wild. Um, so someone is interested in hearing more about the potassium hydroxide. Um, they had said that they had done some reading online that it showed that that can be harmful to the environment in large amounts, maybe to fish, aquatic life, even in small amounts. Um, could you talk more about how the potassium hydroxide is disposed of or the traces that remain that how those are reduced through the aquamation process. Yeah, the, 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 the uh, potassium hydroxide, and I just was reading on it this morning, is reduced mm -hmm. by almost a thousand times before it goes into the waste management, by the time it runs through its cycle. And so that, that's, again, why waste management isn't that concerned uh, about it um, and, and being a food-grade ingredient. Again, it is a chemical. I understand. Mm -hmm. I, I get that. I, I, I can take it up with my hands as long as my hands are are not wet or sweaty or, uh, you know, it'll start tingling right away because it starts doing its thing. It is a caustic lie. There is no doubt about it. Yeah. Uh, but, but it's in small amounts. And I believe that 14 to, to 20 pounds, small amounts with 200 gallons of water and the heat that reduces it. Uh, but my understanding is reduced by a thousand, over a thousand times by the time it, it goes back into the system. That's incredible. So if someone had had a bunch of restorative work done uh, for maybe a viewing or something, are those products broken down in this process as well? Sorry, I was reading. Sorry, I apologize. I was well, reading okay. someone's comment and did not <laughs> listen. My bad. Oh, deal. <laughs> <laughs> so we have someone who's curious about, you know, if a decedent had had quite a bit of restoration done, maybe the family wanted a viewing. Uh, are those products that are used in the body, do those break down as well through that process? They, they are, yes. Yes. We just have to remove any cotton. So on an autopsy case, I would need to remove any cotton that's used. J just more that because uh, I would end up with it possibly clogging my drain more than anything. So that, that's one of the steps we take. But yes, the cosmetics that would be used in, in the death care industry, in, any of that would uh, be fine during the restorative part. Oh, that makes sense. Um, we had someone who was curious. Um, it sounded like you had mentioned effluent being potentially returned to a family. Is that something that you guys are able to do? Yes, we do that in amounts of five to 10 gallons. I actually go to wow. Walmart and I get a, a, a container and uh, you get back. Uh, if, you, if you wish, we're able to siphon that off uh, and, okay. and be able to return that back with the cremains if that's a desire. Uh, now, again, all the affluent you're talking, uh, you know, this stuff is eight pounds a gallon, like a gallon of milk. And so if you had 80 gallons or 100 gallons, you're talking, you know, 800 pounds, you're talking barrels to build, deal with, makes mm -hmm. it very difficult. But it seems like that five to 10 gallon isn't an unmanageable amount to get back. That's amazing. I didn't know that you guys offered that. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, what else do we have in here? Um, so folks are kind of curious about how widespread this process is. Has this become, has aquamation become more prevalent in other countries? Um, it seems like it's kind of cropping up in some states here and there in the U.S., but how's it doing overseas? Yeah, good, good question. Um, the last I checked, 37 states have allowed it. 
um, Washington and California being last year. And so I think as you more, more of that will be occurring, the cost of those machines will go down uh, because they'll be mass producing them. But other countries, yes, Vietnam, uh, part of their tradition is to, is to go back after a year, un, unbury their decedent, and then pick the rest of the tissue off, as gross as that sounds to us. This actually, you can stop the process ahead of time, and now they're able to do it within that four hours time and not wait a year for that tradition. But it's part of their culture and tradition. But yes, South Africa's, uh, um, oh, uh, Mexico. Uh, I'm trying to think of those that have come. Uh, Canada was one of the first countries, even before the U.S. Um, uh, England uh, is looking at it. I think they're working through the logistics on, on the laws. Scotland, I think, is also at that point. But yeah, it's starting to be looked at worldwide. And I think you'll see more states. And I believe it's just a matter of time of all 50 states. Uh, will. And, and only 6% of the country has heard about this. A lot of education mm -hmm. to be done. Oh, certainly. We're really happy to have you here helping us on that project. <laughs> uh, we have someone who's curious about the machinery. You mentioned that the cost of a crematory retort is about a million dollars. Can you tell us about what the rough cost of the machinery for aquamation costs? G good and question. Does it have a cool name, like a retort? <laughs> um, uh, uh, yeah, it's just a vessel, a chamber. Uh, but but we uh, <laughs> a good question. And to c clarify, that million dollars is if we had to add a scrubber, which which the states have not required us. California is looking at adding scrubbers. You know, a retort can be purchased about 200,000 to 250,000, depending on how, how big it is and how many you, people you want to do in a day. Um, but, but an aquamation, to answer your question, is like buying two flame crematories. And, and that's why I believe now as more states have started it, it will start to be uh, uh, mass produced. The cost will come down. Um, you know, in the news article, it talked about it being five to eight hundred dollars more. Um, I'm finding that our local funeral homes are just keeping it the same price as their cremation. Some are charging a little bit more. I've not seen it over the eight hundred dollars. I think people are willing to pay a little more for eco friendly, but it's not thousands of dollars more of which when I talk to uh, to groups, they think it's thousands of dollars more and it is not. Yeah. Yeah, it was kind of a process for us to get access to it here in Washington, uh, and it just was legalized this past year. Could you speak to what that um, what the law change looked like in Oregon? Did they have to change the disposition laws to accommodate your business? You, you know, we added the term dissolution, and okay. then other than that, we followed the rest of our, our laws, so it wasn't a lot of changing of the laws to answer the question. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we were able, so in Oregon, it's called dissolution, not aqua mm -hmm. it's not, uh, but they call it dissolution. Uh, so... Uh, um, I saw someone asked about what about plastic, like mouth guards and eye cap, mm -hmm. though anything plastic would be left. Uh, and so they, they, we would just pull those oh, out wow. ahead of time or after the process. Mm -hmm. Yep. So if we miss something, uh, we would find it after the process. Yep. Yeah, we uh, frequently when we offer this class, we have some folks here in Seattle that offer at a pet funeral home the opportunity to aquamate our, our fur babies. And right, uh, right. they talk about how they find, you know, things that their pets have eaten over time, like mm -hmm. hair ties and things like that, or they come out completely clean. And it's sometimes a little jarring. Yeah, yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah. Okay, let's see if we have any other questions. If you haven't chimed in just yet, please feel free to drop it into the chat. And it looks like we still have a little bit of time left. Um. While folks are kind of mulling that over, is there anything that you wish that more people would ask you about this that just never comes up? Oh, that's a good question. I, I try to answer, uh, you know, cover in my presentation most yeah. of the questions I've been fielded. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so uh, um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't have anything. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Um, okay, so someone is curious if you require a, a decedent to be embalmed or have their uh, restoration work have been have their body restored before they are aqua cremated well in, in uh, looking at that question as i saw it uh, do i need that paperwork i don't uh, i don't need any oh. of that paperwork uh, ahead of time uh, so if they come in restored autopsied embalmed uh, we'll just work with that from there it doesn't change our procedure at all except possibly the undressing of the body into a hospital mm -hmm. gown that makes sense wonderful okay Let's see, anybody else have anything? Amanda, do you have any questions you want to add in? I don't, Dion. This mm -hmm. has been such a great presentation. Thank you. I see you have a question from Patrick on, uh, is there a location in Northern California? Patrick, there is not uh, yet. Uh, they're looking at Southern California opening up. So I think it's a matter of time or a good business mm -hmm. opportunity. Oh, certainly. <laughs> 
Uh, so someone just wants you to clarify the body doesn't have to be embalmed before aquamation. It right? does not. It does not. And, and I saw one there, the family can be involved as much as they like, right up to pushing the body, the button on the, uh, they can help place the body in, uh, into the chamber, the vessel. Uh, they can be there. It's kind of anticlimactic mm -hmm. with the crematory. When they push the yeah. button, they hear a great big boom. Yeah. This is like starting your dishwasher. Very, <laughs> you might see a hose move, a little bit of a movement of the hot water hose. But other than that, it's very, very quiet. Wonderful. Well, um, yeah, so it looks like we just have some folks asking for some additional documentation and recordings and stuff. So we'll make sure to go ahead and send out a follow-up email to everyone that registered. We'll include a copy of today's presentation, the video recording. We'll share Dion's slides with you so you can get all those great images. Um, personally, I'm a big fan of the image of you inside the, uh, inside the chamber. There. That was a delight. Um, We've been so happy to have you. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise, Dion. Well, thank um, you for everybody's uh, yeah. uh, willing to, to listen to me. I, no. can't, I can't hardly get my eight kids to do that. So, oh, great. well, this is definitely more than eight people. It's been wonderful. We're so glad to have everybody here. If anyone thinks of questions they still have unanswered, we'll make sure you have our contact information at PMA as well as Dion. So feel free to reach out to either organization. And, uh, you know, we're just happy to help where we can. And we really hope to see more of you uh, later this week for our other sessions. Thank you so much for attending Green Funerals.